Scam wannabe bankster fraud. I mean, Sam Bankman Fried, the former CEO of failed FTX crypto exchange, had a week of ridiculous mainstream financial press rounds and coverage. His public relations tour started with the New York Times a few days ago at their 2500 per seat dealbook summit hosted by Andrew Ross Sorkin of CNBC, an establishment lackey who spent much of his career trying to whitewash the mass financial criminality of the 2008 global financial crisis and post-QE fallouts in systematic trust. Here are but a few of the lowlights from this hour-long interview. One of the, the letters I got, uh, I want to read to you, Sam, um, because it's from a gentleman who said that he lost his life savings. Um, and the subject line is, Sam Bankman-Fried stole $2 million from me. It says, Andrew, can you please ask SBF why he decided to steal my life savings and the $10 billion more from customers to give to his hedge fund, Alameda? was suspiciously, in quote, trans uh, transferred from FTX wallets after, after yeah. the bankruptcy filing. Yes. And there have been accusations that this is the assistance, effectively, of theft. But, but it seems like when you read the stories, it sounds like a, a bunch of kids uh, who were on Adderall having a sleepover party. Um, I mean, look. I screwed up. There's going to be a time and a place for me to sort of think about myself and my own future, but I don't think this is it. Like, right now, I mean, look, I, I've had a bad month. Um, this has not been a fun month for me, but that's not what matters here. Like, No, that applause was not a post-edit. That was real. I had to go and look in multiple sources. It was real. Somehow, the 2,500 per seat crowd found humor in this ongoing distraction in PSYOP. It gets worse. On behalf of everybody here and on behalf of the public, I want to thank you for engaging in it at a time, in truth, when I know you've been advised not to. So thank you so very, very much. Um, thank you. Sam Bankman Freed, everybody. Today, the head of the U.S. House Committee of Financial Services, Maxine Waters, tweeted, at SBF underscore FTX. We appreciate that you've been candid in your discussions about what happened at FTX. Your willingness to talk to the public will help the company's customers, investors, and others. To that end, we would welcome your participation in our hearing on the 13th. And so the mockery of financial law and order will apparently continue onwards as public spectacle throughout this month. Cartoonist Ben Garrison satirize the ongoing unraveling and eventual untethering of deep crypto industry frauds galore from the eyes of many long-term bullion saving skeptics. I think he pretty much nails one of the largest alleged frauds still somehow yet to unravel, but look out real price discovery if and when it finally does come untethered. Hello there on behalf of SDBullion.com, this is James Anderson with a quick SD Bullion market update. Before we go further, please smash the like button so other sound money stackers can also see this content. If you find value in our weekly bullion market updates here, be sure to subscribe and hit the alert button so you don't miss them. After another year of stealthy, undetectable silver redistribution, this holiday season, I'm turning over a new leaf. And I'm going to get into that holiday spirit of generosity, and I'm going to give away some silver. And thanks to SD Bullion's holiday collection, I can give away silver that matches both the holiday season and my budget. Hey, Sebastian. I'm getting into the holiday spirit a little early this year, and I got you something. Steve, you shouldn't have. Silver? You know, I've actually been wanting to start investing in silver. I can't believe you do this. I mean, you slow down. Steve? Well, there's always next year. The SD Bullion Holiday Collection. Get it before it's gone. Another bullish week of spot silver and gold trading, especially for the white precious monetary metal. This morning, the U.S. government's Bureau of Labor and Statistics published a high jobs report. 
that upon further review was a statistical canard. Think akin to the statistical lies that the BLS uses when reporting official price inflation data. Both silver and gold sold off on the jobs report news only to bounce back nearly immediately to close the week with strength. Silver basically went vertical after a predictable algorithmic price sell-off on the phony BLS jobs report. The spot silver price closed the week decidedly over 23 an ounce, while the spot gold price closed near 1,800 an ounce. Thanks to silver's recent strength, the gold-silver ratio tightened lower to close at 77 for the week. With just less than a month of time remaining in this year, 2022, it will be interesting to see if the four major precious metals can continue their recent rallies and all finish with positive performance for what has been a mixed up and down year for the most part. The U.S. savings rate is now hitting a 21st century low level, signifying stretched budgets. Outstanding credit card loans are at a nominal record high levels and likely to climb until a full-on recession finally rears its ugly head perhaps next year. In terms of current credit card debt levels as a percentage of disposable personal income, there is still room to climb higher this holiday season for average U.S. citizens whose budgets are stretched thin. In what I would deem the biggest news of the week for bullion aficionados, it was announced that recidivist criminal commercial bank JP Morgan will begin acting as co-custodian for the world's largest unsecured gold ETF, typically called by its ticker symbol GLD. First, let's hear what the financial establishment at Reuters had to say on the matter with an article written by Peter Hobson. HSBC will have to share custody with J.P. Morgan of $52 billion in gold bars by Peter Hobson. J.P. Morgan will join HSBC in storing bullion for the world's biggest gold-backed exchange-traded fund ETF. The fund's operator said on Thursday, ending its rival's sole guardianship of the $52 billion stash of gold. The change, which begins on December 6, is a boon for J.P. Morgan, which could rake in millions of dollars of storage fees. HSBC had been the sole custodian for Spider Gold Trust, also known as GLD, since it launched in 2004. The bank currently stores about 910 tons of gold for GLD in London, around a quarter of all the gold held for ETFs globally. Quote, the addition of J.P. Morgan will change the current single custodian and vault operating model to accommodate the activity of the fund in anticipation of future growth. The World Gold Council, which runs the fund, said in a statement, WGC executive Joe Cavatoni said the council wanted to diversify its storage and adding J.P. Morgan, quote, gives us another commercial entity with a vested interest in supporting the product. He said the WGC would seek to funnel gold to J.P. Morgan, for example, by sending it new metal added to the fund and held out the possibility of an eventual even split between the two banks. Quote, if we get to the point where there's a very equal balance between the relationships, that would be exciting for us, he said. Typical fees for large clients like GLD are around 30 to 40 basis points of the value of the gold stored, a market source said. It's actually 40 basis points. Uh, sorry to say that, but uh, he should have been more clear. That means equal division of the fund's 910 tons would see J.P. Morgan take revenue of around 8 to 10 million a year from HSBC. Cavatoni said the WGC's agreement with J.P. Morgan allowed to store gold in the United States and Switzerland, but for the time, the fund intended to continue storing all its gold in London. HSBC said, quote, We're pleased to continue acting as custodian for the World Gold Council's Spider Gold Trust. J.P. Morgan declined to comment. So now J.P. Morgan will not only be the custodian for the world's largest unsecured silver ETF slush fund called SLB, but will also become a major overseer or co-custodian of the world's largest unsecured gold ETF, which is charted right here. The top portion of this chart illustrates the ongoing fact that unsecured GLD shareholders are continually losing annually 0.4% in fees to the fund, essentially diverging and further underperforming the ongoing gold spot price as time goes along. That is not the case for people who own American Gold Eagles, for instance. The premiums of Gold Eagles have been skyrocketing this year. GLD shareholders are unsecured creditors. They only own price and counterparty risk. They don't own an ounce of gold bullion by owning the GLD shares. In a bankruptcy scenario, they might get a few pennies on the dollar, or perhaps nothing at all. The only entities that can redeem unsecured underlying 400-ounce gold bars 
from supposed GLD stashes in London are the following litany of Bankster Commercial Bank desk names, many of which have been fined and or prosecuted for rigging gold and other precious metals prices this last decade, sometimes for nearly decade-long spans of duration. If you're a shareholder of GLD, go read the 37-page prospectus if you're confused. It's jammed full of not our liability loopholes, which can be boiled down to this simple image. Turning to what I deem the best two long-term bullion values at the moment, I ran a Twitter poll not long ago, and it was nearly and understandably split on this question. This chart is only updated through October 20th, 2020 on Nick Lard's Gold Charts R Us website, but I wanted to show it to you to give you an idea of how half of the four major precious metals have outperformed versus the other half's underperformance throughout this full fiat currency era. My contention is that in time, this picture is going to change. We'll get to silver in a minute, but we're going to start with a quick focus on platinum. Here's a more updated version of this chart covering the full fiat currency era. We're going to strip palladium out as I would ignore that precious metal mostly when considering buying of the four major precious metals, just given how much it's performed in the last six, seven years. The World Platinum Investment Council recently published forecasts of coming deficits for platinum next year in 2023. Now I'm going to leave a few article links in the show notes below for you platinum bulls out there or you platinum interested if you wanted to dig into the data and why they believe platinum deficits are coming next year and perhaps further. Now if we simply look back at recent NYMEX history before palladium prices ran up price walls, the NYMEX palladium warehouses got raided. Then, at the same time, roughly, the Palladium ETFs also got raided. The similar is trending right now with both NYMEX Platinum inventories and as well Platinum ETF underlying holdings. Before this building bullion bull market ends, it's not going to surprise me at all to see Platinum outperform Palladium and ultimately in time move back towards the then much higher valuation where it's almost relative with gold, as it historically has always been. To close this week, a few clips from this recent London Bullion Market Association discussion between various longtime silver market analysts, which you will likely find interesting as well. Basically, it's an hour long discussion, and I'll leave a link in the show notes if you want to go watch the whole thing. Uh, be careful, though, some of it's going to put you to sleep. Um, basically, there were good parts, though, where they discussed silver's bullish supply deficit fundamentals. And they also wondered how it's yet to have shown up in a rapidly escalating spot price. Because quite a few people at the conference were saying, oh, the market's absorbing all this metal that's coming out from different vaults and depositories and so forth. Uh, we tend to think of it the other way around. The metal's coming out because the market wants it. So that's, that's one of the reasons why spot prices don't necessarily reflect the fundamentals. They always do at bottom, but you've got this noise that's built in because of the activity in, in the futures markets. Because the tail, the tail is wagging the dog, then, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and Jeff, Jeff Rhodes in the uh, Dubai, just to throw something in here, I, I had the great good fortune to be at the Dubai Precious Metals Conference last week. Um, and Jeff Rhodes was running a panel about price discovery. Um, and Jeff's been in the market for as long as I have, which is far too long. Um, and he's always been uh, a fundamentals drives the futures. But he was saying last week that possibly because he's now got a son who's active in one of the exchanges, but because the, the way he's been watching the markets over the past few years, he's increasingly falling into the camp that by the futures actually drives, drives the physical. But that's right. a, a matter for, for a debate elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead and rewind it back. If you didn't catch their admission, that the derivative futures market, mainly the COMEX, has been the tail wagging the spot price dog for the last few years, I assume. Pretty much since COVID, that's been the case. What I think these four analysts are missing is the building an upcoming storm for silver, which will likely have a three-pronged combination of continued high physical demand, both industrial and monetary store of value demand, as well as larger institutional capital inflows finally returning in size into the silver ETF complex, requiring net outsized buying of 1,000 ounce bars, as well as momentum bully longs ramming into the comics, like Paul Tudor Jones once put them, bully longs, 
and they're gonna come in size, looking to scalp profits on the long side, be them commercial desks, hedge funds, and our high net worth leveraged COMEX traders. Each coming quarter that passes, we are in my opinion moving closer towards a perfect storm where spot silver runs past 30 and eventually beyond its seemingly ancient $50 an ounce high into an eventual mania that moves triple digits in nominal spot price to come. To close this week, I want to leave a link in the comments section and show notes below with a recent interview our company founder and SD Bullion CEO Tyler Wall had with Silver Bullion TV. It's just over 35 minutes with topics ranging from CBDCs, the physical bullion market dynamics currently, and Tyler's concerns for what's to come. And as for me, that's all for this week's SD Bullion Market Update. As always, to you all out there, take great care of yourselves and those you love. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give our video a thumbs up. To keep getting bullion-related news and industry insights, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Finally, hit that alert button so you know when we publish fresh content. Thank you.